here's what I want to know before we start getting into what 256 Media is all about. What's the first video game you remember playing? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, it's probably boxing for the Intellivision. Um, you know, in retrospect, I, I realized when I was playing it, uh, it had already been on the market for quite some time. And so it was like second or third, or third hand. There was like a heady, any moment in the late seventies, early eighties, where like every toy company was making a video game console. And so yep. my parents had gotten the television. It had like this, um, it was like a numerical pad that you held and it had numbers on it. And then you, the games came with, um, it was like a little plastic sheet that you would slide over the numerical pad because each game had like different controls. So boxing, I think they also had like Dr. J versus Larry Bird basketball was in that set as well. Oh, but nice. Yeah, it's a uh, very old, <laughs> a very old video game. I am not familiar with that one, but it sounds fascinating. I would <laughs> love yeah, to see that turn up at a garage sale or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the company you founded, 256, helps brands engage with the world of video games. So tell us why would brands want to get into that market? What's the ROI for them? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. Um, I mean, the biggest reason is that's where your audience is. You know, there are roughly around, you know, two and a half billion people that play video games. Um, if you look at, I mean, just thinking as I'm speaking right now, you know, one of the most popular pieces of pop culture right now is the the Last of Us TV show on, on HBO, not just in terms of like its critical acclaim, but in terms of like viewership numbers. Um, you know, you see companies like Netflix, for example, investing both on the IP side and also um, also in the creation of video games as well. Um, if you look, you know, statistically speaking, 99% of those under the age of 18 uh, say that they play, they play video games and some research that we found like older millennials in particular, such as myself are not aging out of the, not, are not aging out of the act of play. So I think it's one of these things where, you know, the same reason, you know, that there's that John Dillinger quote, like, why do you rob banks? It's like, that's where the money is. I think for brands, it's, uh, in a lot of ways, like a no, a no brainer, like, your audience is already playing games. And so the question for you is, how are you going to engage with them? What is your approach? Um, how is it integrated into the work that you're already doing? And there's no better time to do it than, than yesterday. But I think we're certainly for, certainly for Gen Z as well, there's a sense in which um, like gaming is going to be reflective of uh, generationally, both for Gen Z and for millennials. Gaming is going to be part of like that context in which they, they think about the world. It's a main meeting space that they use. They use it to not just play games, but to engage with one other. It's a, it's a seat of culture. So yeah, my argument for my argument for brands is you, know, you should just be thinking about it because that's where your audience already is. And so um, in the same way that you're engaged in anything else that your audience is interested in, games should absolutely be a part of that calculation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, video games, it's it, it has a reputation of being a kid's thing, but it's been around so long that a lot of the, <laughs> you know, a lot of people who were kids a long time ago are now playing with their kids. Mm -hmm, so it's mm -hmm. crossing generations. What are some examples of brands that you have worked with and the ways that you've connected them to the gaming world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're deeply focused in, in research and strategy. So one of the things that, you know, on the research side, one of the things that's really hard is there's some demographic information about games um, in terms of like the, you know, the age of the people who play them. Uh, and there's some play style information that's publicly available. So what types of games people like to play? Um, what are the personalities when they're playing games? For most brands, though, they, they're going to want to know like more consumer facing information. So behavioral information for their specific audience. And that is one of the places where we step in. So we worked with SoundCloud recently. Uh, they were deeply interested in the world of games. They were seeing their audience playing more and more games, and they were trying to figure out what it was what their way in was. So we did a big audience audience segmentation project for them, where we took a cohort of people who are already in the SoundCloud audience. And SoundCloud is a it's a music streaming and distribution service online. So um, they compete with a lot of different folks. But initially started as a home for. DJs to post uh, mix, mixes and uh, it's, it's grown since then. But um, we did a bunch of audience segmentation work for them, comparing the existing audience of SoundCloud users to people who were not part of the SoundCloud audience. And we took a look at them through a gaming lens. So 
not only what types of games they were playing, the social context in which they were playing games was really important, uh, what types of activities they were going to be interested in to create points of context uh, that would be useful for SoundCloud to engage in creative campaigns. One of the big things that we found out at research, they had gone really hard on the um, on the esports side of things. And one of the things that we found in research was that um, cosplay, so dressing up as your favorite video game character and board games were bigger points of interest for their audience. So that's one thing that we encourage brands. Like if you don't understand like how your, how your customer is engaging with the world of games, because there's so many ways to go about doing it, you might sort of uh, lean on your instincts, which could be totally off. So research is one big category that we work on. We work with clients with. Um, the other is on the strategy side of the equation. So once you've sort of understood you know, who your audience is, how you can talk to them, putting that into practice and understanding like, well, what's the, what is the creative output that we should ostensibly be designing for them? So we worked with another agency here in Los Angeles with Google Play, for example. They were interested in gaming as a gaming audience, but they were really curious about what that would look like from a creative campaign uh, standpoint. So we worked in a creative strategy capacity for them, um, helped them design a video series that focused on independent creators who laddered up to Google Play's brand and put together a you know set of like video production that uh, ultimately met what Google Play was trying to do to establish themselves as a as a cultural leader in the world, specifically for mobile games. So those are like the research and strategy. Those are like two big pieces that you know we do. So we work with clients like YouTube and Intel and um, you know all of them are, are deeply interested in games, but a lot of times they're having trouble kind of taking that first step and figuring out like, well, I know games intellectually are a big deal, but like what should I do next? And so that's the place where we find it's helpful to step in and help give them some direction. Exactly. Yeah. I can see a lot of brands saying, okay, this is something I should be doing, but I have no idea how. And some of the, yeah. some of the fits seem a little more natural, like SoundCloud, of course, yeah, yeah. video games have soundtracks, you know? So, um, <laughs> I mean, I remember Tony Hawk. Yeah. That was like, what a great way to discover new music. Uh, so many, uh, punk rock artists got, noticed because yeah. they were featured in Tony Hawk. So I can see musicians wanting to be featured in video games. That's kind of a no brainer these days, but what are some less traditional or just less obvious fits that you've worked with? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, that's what you identified like one of the big, the big challenges for, for brands, which is, you know, so you sort of get to this place where you're like, Oh, games are a really big deal and we want to do something in it. But like now, what? Like, what are the points of entry there? So, we divide the gaming space up into three main categories and three sort of layers. You have a play layer, which is any activity that happens in and about games. So, the Tony Hawk example that you mentioned, for example, for you know, for a record label to engage in like a licensing arrangement to get music into a video game. You're doing stuff in and about the game world. A lot of the stuff that you see with things like Roblox or Minecraft recently did a partnership with Burberry. Um, like those are all opportunities to do stuff like at that at that play layer. Um, the share layer is one that we often find that there's great opportunities to do stuff there. And the, the share layer basically needs any social context uh, in, in and about games, but it sort of feeds on the back of things that are happening in game universes, but they don't, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to the game itself. There's often, when you're trying to work with game makers, there's time, price considerations that are, are, are non, or are non-trivial. And so that share layer can be really helpful. So that's everything from doing a Twitch stream with a popular influencer, for example, or, um, you know, creating a, you know, a playlist on Spotify that thematically is in the vein of like what you think your audience likes to do on the play side. And then that last piece is the experience layer, which is you know, anything that happens like, uh, you know, in game, anything that happens with like virtual events, live events. Um, you know, gaming has a lot of big, um, in real life, like touch points. So everything from the gaming sections of comic book conventions to, board game nights at, you know, your local board game shop up through, you know, more formal like conferences or events, things like, you know, E3 or Summer Games Fest or whatever, uh, whatever it might be. So um, we're often trying to direct, um, often trying to direct clients and say, hey, try to figure out, um, try to figure out like where your strengths are going to be and then build off the back of those to direct towards, uh, direct yourself towards like which one of those layers you most, most reasonably equipped to, uh, to, to, to step into. What are some pitfalls? brands should be aware of when they're dipping their toes into this? I'd say, you know, one big pitfall I'd say is consistency. So we encourage clients to think about gaming as a long-term relationship. Yeah, you, it's not a check the box kind of arrangement. Um, it's not something that you can just like dip into 
um, if you think of gaming as a as a culture, you really want to find your specific subculture within it, and that means building a long term plan for engagement. It doesn't have to be you know 100 percent of your budget or anything like that. Like you know, we would never tell someone that this is the only thing that they should be focused on. But I do think making a commitment to say that you're going to be in the space for a longer period of time is really really important because it takes practice. Um, I'd say the second big thing is uh, thinking of gamers as only one audience. That's a really common one that we see. So sort of thinking of gamers as, you know, and part of the challenge there is that, you know, there's gamer as a verb, which is like to play, you know, to play games, but there's also gaming as an identity. And so it's really important for brands not to think uh, only through the lens of, uh, only through the lens of gaming as like an identifiable identity marker. So when you type in like gamer into, you know, into Google images or something like that and think like, oh, that's everyone who plays games. Um, that's like another really big, uh, that's another really big mistake that, that, that I often see brands make. Um, I think that the third thing is, um, I would say tied to that is like thinking of gamers as primarily being like youth driven and sort of ignoring some of the life stage considerations for people who play games. Um, it's not a question if your audience plays games, it's a question of like which games they play, how they engage. We sort of think about things around identity, affinity, and activity. So identity being those markers, like do you self-identify as a gamer? That could be one way that you sort of fit into that cohort. Um, the activity piece, also kind of straightforward. Like, do you play games? So, uh, you know, how consistently do you play games? Um, and then the affinity piece is important as well. So does your social context allow for you? Is it a way that you identify yourself in your in your social group? So to use me as an example, like I, you know, would consider myself, like if someone asked me, are you a gamer? I'd say like, yeah, I think of myself as being a, a gamer, but like, um, I probably don't fit maybe that stereotype. Um, from an activity standpoint, I have a one-year-old daughter. So my time playing games is, has gone down dramatically, you know, but I'm no less interested in gaming as a space. And then from an affinity standpoint, you know, I don't have a ton of friends. That's not a big, that's not a big driver for me. Um, partly it's just life stage stuff. So if you were to say, if you're trying to rope me in or market to me, like through the world of games, like it's probably not going to happen, like through my existing, like social graph. Um, and it might not even happen through like the game itself. The way you might market to me is like mostly from an identify and identity marker. So that's the I think just it's good to complicate your understanding of who gamers are. Um, I think that will lead you to some like really interesting places and uh, help you create an, a custom strategy that's going to be much more tailored to like who your audience actually is as opposed to who you think they might be. So do you rock your baby to sleep w with one hand <laughs> and, and play the game with the other? Have you mastered that yet? <laughs> no, not yet. You know, it's funny, I used to live in New York City and there's a whole genre of like strap hanger games that I had. So you could like hold on to the you know, subway strap and then like, yep. kind of do something else with your phone. <laughs> yeah. um, I, you know, my, my dog, she's, she's pretty, she's in a wiggle mode right now. So it's pretty tough to do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> do anything else. <laughs> yeah. That's probably for the best. Yeah, yeah, it's probably for the best. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit more about the identity of gamers because I've seen some of the writing on your site where you're working to debunk the myths about gamers. Tell us about some of those myths that a lot of people have. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the biggest one is, you know, it's going to be like this idea that the gamers fit like one shape or size, right? So mm -hmm. the gamers only fit into this like one, you know, one big category. I think what's really hard there is that that's something that's like reinforced in popular culture. So like you often see, like you often see that reinforced in popular culture, like recently, like the New York Times kind of uh, described like, oh, gaming, which used to be the province of, of younger people, right? It's like that hasn't been true mm -hmm. for quite quite some time. So that's, that's like a really big one. I, I think the other one, uh, you know, the other big one is that gamers don't just play, um, they don't just play like one thing. That's like one big, I think that's one big perception. Some of the research that we did found that, you know, the most popular and the most hated game genres were often the same thing. Um, in the sense that like, if you are a marketer and you are only focused on say like first person shooters, for example, that's going to be great for some an audience that identifies as gamers. And that's also going to be a turnoff for the exact same audience. And so there are some trade offs that you ultimately, um, that you ultimately have to make. Uh, and, and that I think it's really hard for folks to understand that like there's a sense in which, um, in a sense in which we use this phrase like, you know, a big net loses a lot of fish, right? So if you go for like the biggest game in the world, it's not like, necessarily going to check all the boxes in terms of like who you're ultimately who you're ultimately trying to reach um and then the third i think a third big myth is that people grow out of gaming you know one of the things that we're finding is that millennials in particular are keeping gaming as a like a longer term 
life stage sort of thing. And so this idea that like gamers, you basically get to an age where you're like, ah, I'm not interested in games anymore, as opposed to the way in which you engage with games changes. Um, I think that's a big myth. It's like, oh, it's only for, you know, only for the young and um, Mm -hmm. no one else will ultimately play games. So those are three that I would say are are big myths. There are obviously others as well, but, you know, I I think it's, uh, it's important to understand, you know, at the end of the day that like, it's a really big, diverse group. And so you just need to find like your particular niche inside of this uh, much larger audience. Now, of, of course, stereotypes of gamers are unfair, but uh, there are some <laughs> negative behaviors that do exist online. We've heard stories about sexism and, and racism and stuff. Mm-hmm. And what would you say to a brand that's a little hesitant about yeah. uh, working in that and, and potentially getting their reputation tarnished by negative behavior. Yeah. 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 I mean, the brand safety stuff is like, that's like a number one, a number one concern. Um, mm. uh, for like we hear from, you know, we hear from clients is like, is this going to negatively impact my brand? Um, I think, uh, there's a couple of things, you know, I'd say first and foremost, making sure we, we think about fit a lot for clients. So just making sure that you have the right marketing organizational, and audience fit. And by that, I mean, does your marketing, is your marketing organization, is it committed to doing something in games? That's something that we often see where, um, you know, from an organizational level, like the CEO or CMO is interested in games. And then that, that there's not buy-in like all the way down that, that leads to poor execution or uh, it's the other way around where it's just younger people and they're not getting buy-in from senior leadership. From a marketing perspective, super important to understand if you do something in gaming, making sure that like your budget and capabilities aligns with your expectations. So, you know, for example, we see this sometimes where clients are like, oh, I want to do something big like in Fortnite. It's like, you've never done your, we want to make our own game. That's a common one. It's like, oh, I want to make our own video game and it's like do you have the budget to really do something like that do you have experience to build an interactive experience like that do you you know it's just it's just one of these things where you're setting yourself up to to create a um, to create a to basically to have a bad time and then the last one is an audience fit question as well again making sure that like what you think your audience is from their game playing selves actually actually matches um the um I, you know from a brand safety standpoint in terms of like negative in terms of negative behaviors like it is, it can be a real thing. Um, some of it, a lot of it depends on like where you go to play and, uh, ultimately how you vetted what your opportunities are. So we find this like working with streamers, for example, and want to make sure that like you've vetted them appropriately, that you're working with streamers who are emblematic of your brand values. The same goes with, you know, any in game partnerships, making sure that those games are once they're emblematic of what you're trying to do as a brand. And so um, I think the open-ended side of like, oh, something bad might happen to us. Um, you know, that's just some of that's just a risk of a risk of marketing. But I will say that like the places where we've seen problems, it's usually one of two things. It's either you haven't done a sufficient amount of research to make sure whoever you're working with on a partnership side um, is someone who has your best interests at heart. Um, and then the other side of it is making sure that the messaging that you're bringing to the market actually matches where actually matches like the tone and spirit. So one thing we see is like brands will often focus on like very like aggressive, like aggro, like sort of thinking about like all gamers in this bucket in a very aggro sort of way. It's not their brand. It feels inconsistent. Um, you know, it feels inconsistent with um, their audience. And as a result, can attract the ire of people who, you know, attract the ire of people who are like, this doesn't feel right at all. So, you know, a combination of like research and messaging, that's the best way forward. But um, yeah, I don't want to minimize and say like, it doesn't require in some ways, it doesn't requires like an expert touch to make sure that you're putting the right thing out. Again, that long-term engagement piece super important when you look at brands like we work with intel for example they've been doing stuff in the gaming space for a really really long time and that builds a lot of trust so if something happens you know they build trust in that community and it makes it much easier to kind of weather something like that as opposed to if you're a newcomer you do something that's poorly received um then it's much easier to be like oh we're never doing that again um so again that consistency piece is really important because you know everyone makes mistakes but making sure for gaining audiences that you've earned your right to be there definitely is a way to um make sure you're protected all right yeah that's great point great point and you know i i I would encourage brands not to be afraid of getting into the video game world because of something that might happen because hey even if you're advertising on social media you might get some comments that make your brand look bad it's just it yeah it's part of it but if you have that if you do the strategy and the upfront work and you know work with uh someone like yourself who knows this space really well then right. you know, you'll be fine yeah exactly 
you know, another brand you worked with that I, I thought was really interesting was Warby Parker. Can you tell us about that? Because that's one of those brands that's like, huh, well, what do they have to do with the video game world? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's a, um, that's a really good one. I, you know, I interacted with, um, with their CEO and, you know, he's someone, I, you know, one of the things I'm finding is like generationally also, um, you know, for challenger brands that are, you know, for challenger brands that are run by um, like younger people. So, you know, I turned 40 last year. And so I, one of the things that I'm finding like life stage wise is that you know, I'm often interacting with people as opposed to when I started the business, you know, 10, 15 years ago. You know, my cohorts were not necessarily people who are in control of like budget. And so one of the things I'm finding with challenger brands with uh, with CEOs or executives, senior marketing executives who've grown up on video games, there is like a latent interest there. And that's something that could be really powerful. And that was true for, for Warby Parker, for their, uh, for their CEO, Neil Blumenthal. And so they were interested in gaming. I think uh, their approach to it was from a design standpoint. They were interested in the design language. Right? Warby Parker is a tremendously de- design driven and creativity driven brand. And there was an acknowledgement that um, there was an acknowledgement that gaming was something that their audience was interested in. And there was some interesting stuff that could be done there. Um, they were also one of the rare examples, you know, typically we don't advise clients to, to build their own video games, but um, you know, for Warby Parker, it were, ended up working out really well because we, we combined it with a couple different things. We did a, you know, basically a, a custom set of lenses and then did some thematic work for them around the intersection of games, design, and eyesight that was featured on their blog and then featured on social. And then the, on the e-com side of things, um, we built a, you know, built a video game for them that kind of played, it was like set on a, you know, a custom, basically a, a desk of a Warby Parker a customer. It's a game called Warbs and you, move around different objects. It was like a matching pattern game. It lived on their website, but also lived at retail. We had, uh, you know, basically we had physical ex- executions from it, uh, of it on, on tablets inside of Warby Parker retail locations. So that's a great, typically we don't advise clients to go about like making, making games, but that was one where they have great points of entry on the, you know, uh, great points of entry on com on the site of purchase, but also at retail. And it helped kind of like all work together in an integrated sort of way. So um, that was one where I think they were thinking really creatively, both in terms of like how gaming might, um, work at an attract layer from an awareness standpoint. Like, how do we get people top funnel interested in? So they had a whole campaign that was focused on games, uh, but all the way down the funnel, where people like at the point of purchase were actually engaging with games as well. So that was really fun. We were able to do something really big from a top funnel standpoint. Able to do stuff from a content strategy standpoint in terms of pushing out some of the messaging via social and also through their company blog, and then again to be able to do stuff at retail when people are physically trying on a set of glasses um, was really really cool and really really fun project. So uh, they did a great job. It was great. I loved I loved working with them. Um, and uh, these are Warby Parkers. So <laughs> it's been a, a, nice. a long time, a yep. long time relationship. I, yep, I wear Warby Parkers too, and it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a really cool brand. And I, I imagine that must have really enhanced the in store experience for a lot of people as well as the the online experience that's just uh that's yeah great. yeah that's absolutely great. you mentioned esports earlier um first could you just briefly define that for listeners who might not be aware yeah, of what yeah. it is and then talk about what are, what's the opportunity to uh market to those audiences yeah esports is very interesting so you know esports is just a it's shorthand for competitive games so it's just taking the competitive side of games and then putting them in a sports context in the sense that you know there's leagues and competition um you know we've done some work in the past with you know overwatch league with riot games who runs league of legends so like it's a space that we've been involved with in the past um esports is interesting because you know, over the last 10 years, one of the things I often see is there's like a rise and fall with like different shorthand for video games. So virtual worlds was one, you know, 10, 15 years ago when, uh, you know, when, when world of Warcraft was very popular, I mean, world of Warcraft is still very popular, but like when that was kind of coming on the, you know, the emergence of a, of the cultural scene, like, you know, uh, South Park, for example, had done an episode about World of Warcraft. So people were like thinking about like virtual worlds. <laughs> and, yeah, Second Life was new at the time, and so people were thinking about like, oh, what is that? What, what is that like? Gamification was the next one, um, and that was when you had things like Farmville and Facebook games, and then later that you know crossed over to things like mobile games, things like Candy Crush, etc. Um, esports was kind of the next big term where you know so you have people who are sort of thinking. I don't want to talk about video games, but esports are a way for me to sort of engage with 
the world of games, but in a context that I understand, which is like, if you understand sports in some ways, you understand some of the things that are happening um, uh, on the esports side. Now the metaverse, that's the last one, which is just really just another shorthand for like 3D immersive games like Roblox, Minecraft, etc. Um, the, the the entry points for esports, there, there are some caveats just in terms of the considerations that brands should have in terms of thinking about esports. Um, you know, one is that, you know, I think we're definitely on the, like the tail end of um we're all definitely on the tail end from like i'd say like an esports hype cycle standpoint um you know phase plan is a good example they you know sort of had a big new york times profile it's a collection of you know basically streamers and influencers who started as an esports team and then later became cultural influencers then they did a cpac they went public now they're at risk of being delisted so there's definitely like i'd say from an esports standpoint it's on the the tail end of the life cycle that said, it doesn't mean that it's not a fit. Um, there are some ways in which like esports and uh, competitive games can be an excellent place for um, turnkey executions, specifically because some of the infrastructure around esports should be pretty familiar to marketers. Um, you can buy sponsorships, for example, with individual teams. Um, you can buy like logo placements on team jerseys. You can sponsor a league. Um, in many instances, you can buy like you know pre-roll and mid-roll advertising for a specific um, for a specific event. Um, esports is also really interesting because it's also one of the the few places where you see um, large public demonstrations of game playing in a game playing context. So just like with actual sports, you have thousands of people that show up and they're engaged. Gaming doesn't, you know, so much of the activity with gaming, most of it happens online, but esports is one of the places where, you know, outside of like fan conventions and then, you know, sort of some smaller things like board game nights, esports are interesting because it's a place where you have people who love video games. They come to a place to do something. And that's one of the places where you can get, you know, real good IRL experience in terms of like trying to reach some, reach somebody. The other thing I would say is that um, many of the esports teams and leagues, um, are well positioned to work well with brands in the sense that they have the right uh, person sitting across the table who's going to be familiar with you as a marketer. That's not always true if you want to do something with a video game developer where the person who's leading up branded efforts might be the director of business development who may not work with brands at all. It might be the director of marketing as more of a PR background. They're not really focus on, you know, co-branded or partnerships. It might be the CEO who's mostly focused on the product side. So, um, you know, one of the nice things about esports is that, you know, without fail, the folks who are doing things there typically come from marketing background, again, because the way that they are positioning that space is much more akin to like what's happening with live sports. And so you see a lot of the same language and it makes, it makes things very easy for brands to step in. Um, big caveat there is just make sure that like it's a place where your audience like actually actually is um if you go to an esports event there's definitely like a type of person um the fandom varies from place to place so like fighting games for example tournaments like evo um that happens in places like las vegas that audience is going to be very different from one that happens with league of legends which is going to be like, very different from one that happens with hearthstone it's no different than actual sports where like a tennis audience is going to be slightly different from a golf audience, which is going to be slightly different from a, you know, English premier league audience. So just make sure if you're interested in the space on esports that you've done the research to make sure like this is the actual place where your audience actually is, because uh, yeah, you don't want to do like a, you know, a big partnership or something. And it like doesn't actually resonate with who your target actually is. Right. Right. Great advice. And do you, uh, when you're working with brands, do you, caution them about being too heavy handed and just being careful not to make gamers feel like they're being advertised at, but that it's a seamless experience. How do you walk that line? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's a funny thing. I think there's like a perception that like gamers as an audience don't like being marketed to. Um, and it, the irony is that, you know, this is an audience that is like is ruthlessly loyal to just a different set of brands, the video game brands, right? So Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft, their favorite game publisher. Like this is an audience that thinks very deeply about commerce, uh, very, very deeply about commerce. And so, and there are brands that, you know, if you look at like um, brands, I mean, I use Intel as an example, um, but you also have brands like say like HyperX, for example, like there are peripherals brands that are doing it. And so like, there are lots of people who um, the, the, the gamers have an attachment to because they can explicitly, they can explicitly say like, this is a company in my space 
that adds value to my experience. And so game companies obviously fit the bill there. And they'll obviously they'll turn they'll turn on a game company at the, you know, basically at the you know, drop of the hat if they feel like they've been wronged in some kind of way. Um, but that also includes kind of like these uh, sort of pair gaming organizations that could be like headset makers, uh, microphone makers. You think Blue Yeti, for example, is a brand that has like great purchase with video games, Elgato. Like there's some of these technology brands that help facilitate gaming experiences, everything from like headsets to microphones to like gaming chairs. Like these are all brands that that are in the gaming space. And so the reason why, the reason why they, they, they feel like they belong there is because they've earned the right, because they can demonstrate that they can add value. There's nothing that says that like Red Bull as a drink, as a soft drink, you know, it, it is more of a gaming brand than something else. It's just that they put the work in over time. It's like, hey, look, we're trying to find a way to add value. We're connecting a specific type of gaming, one that's like high intensity, high energy, that involves caffeine. <laughs> that's what caffeine that fits for us. But there are other kinds of games out there. There's cozy games, for example. And so there's no reason why another brand can't um, can't step in there. So um, I, I think there's a sense there's a sense in which like gamers, uh, there's a tension because it's like gamers, there are some specificities around like marketing to gamers. However, gamers are also humans and they consume other things like outside of games. On some of the research that we've done, we found that like, you know, gaming is not necessarily the primary activity of people who identify as gamers. When they go through our screener to self-identify as gamers, it's not the only thing that they're doing. They're watching TV, they're playing sports. They are a whole, they're, they're well-rounded human beings. And but that also means that they're susceptible to marketing just like everybody else. So it's not a, you know, I, I don't think they're just like a to the alien species or anything like that that's somehow immune to the charms of like contemporary marketing techniques. I think it's just a function of they're just not getting the things from you that, you know, not you specifically, Matt, but like, you know, they're not getting things from brand X that maybe they're getting from a uh, you know, more gaming native brand. So you just got to figure out like, what's your, what is, what is your place? What is your place at the table? And uh, make sure that you put the work in to make sure that you uh, earn that right because it, it absolutely can happen. You mentioned the metaverse, and I think uh, right now we're we're at a place where a lot of people are they associate that term with Mark Zuckerberg, yeah. and you know, and, and thinking, oh, this is just going to be a flop. But you've uh, you had a really good point on the two five six website in one of your articles. Uh, it's talked about um, we already have yeah. <laughs> multiple metaverses that exist, like Fortnite. Yeah. That's technically a metaverse. So, is the future of the internet? Do you see that it's going to eventually feel like one big video game network or what do you think uh we're looking at oh i don't know uh, i mean I'm, I'm a little bit biased in the sense that like i'm okay if the metaverse is quote unquote just video games like i personally mm-hmm. and professionally am okay with that um i think that's one of the places where there's a disconnect between like the metaverses of the now when we think about it and so, so you're really talking about fortnite you're talking about roblox and you're talking about minecraft Right. Other places like Decentraland or um, Horizon Worlds, these pale in comparison. Like these are, you know, if you think about game, if you think about those three that I mentioned, like those are doing numbers on the, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of people scale, right, on a monthly or an annual basis. Whereas like the other sort of things that are in that category are you know, hundreds of thousands, you know, some cases like tens of thousands, like we're really talking about significantly smaller audiences. So if we're being intellectually audience, intellectually honest, when we're talking about the metaverse, we're really just talking about video games. And so you do, I do ask folks to like, you know, be honest. It's like, is, is it because you want to do something in games and you're, you're afraid and you're scared to say that that's what you're doing. I'm doing something in gaming. Or is it that you're interested in 3d, 3d environments and games are the only place where you can do that, you know, and do that today. I mean, I think long term, um, I just think that some of the other things that were part of the metaverse package, it's just going to be, it's just going to be a long time. And you've seen some of the language start to adjust where it's like, oh, the metaverse is five, 10 years away to more recently, Tim Sweeney, who runs Epic Games, is saying that like some of the technical challenges around building a persistent, 3D universe that you access like via a headset of some shape or capacity. Some of the technical challenges now are like 20, 30 years away, right? So it's not just like, you know, the, the gap between like the Wright brothers and then landing on the moon, right? You sort of think about that being as a very long time scale, right? And so the question is like, are we like, are we at the beginning of the Apollo program or are we like 
the Wright brothers, you know, basically at Kitty Hawk getting the plane that's out there. And so I tend to believe it's like probably somewhere in between, but it's going to be a long time. And the reason why, like for me, I think the other thing that's important for marketers is like to differentiate and say like, look, if you're an investor, like if you're Mark Zuckerberg, like he's thinking, you know, he's been running this company for 20 years. He's thinking about the next 20, 30 years. Like he's thinking on a time scale versus like you're thinking on like an annual quarterly basis, right? So you're thinking about what can I do with the dollars that have been allocated to me this year? And so that's why I ask people to be honest about like, if you want to do something like in the quote unquote metaverse, you're really talking about video games, because that's the only place that you could do something like today. If you want to be part of the discourse to talk about like what the future of technology and entertainment looks like, that's great. But just, I think just being honest about like, well, what do you, what are you trying to achieve in the upcoming year? Um, just because the metaverse, the ROI on metaverse stuff is like, it's, it's on a significantly longer time scale. And so you should just be realistic about like what, what you're trying to do and ultimately why. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're so impatient. Yeah, <laughs> we I just know. want, I know, I know. <laughs> like, we really think that the, <laughs> this is going to happen like within yeah. a year. I mean, it's, it's so complex that, uh, yeah, if we get it within 20 years, that would still be pretty amazing human accomplishment. Yeah, no, absolutely. As, as we wrap up, I just want to ask you, like, aside from what you just talked about with the metaverse, where do you see the future of the gaming industry in the next few years? And how can brands be a part of that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think one really significant development is going to be non-game brands, whether overtly or, co or covertly engaging as gaming competitors, gaming publishers. Great example, New York Times is a games publisher, not just because of the crossword, but they have other games like Spelling Bee, for example. Wordle was a big acquisition for them. Um, it's a driver for subscriptions for them. They may not think of themselves as being a games publisher, but as far as I'm concerned, like they are a games publisher. They publish a game that you know lots of people play every single day. And so whether or not that's something that they sort of embody as a part of the New York Times brand or not, it's kind of a separate question. Um, Netflix, another great example where you know they're building out not just on the IP side with things that they're trying to do with um, you know visual content, so things like Castlevania, for example, but you know they're making games that are available on mobile. They're looking at where time and attention is being spent. So I think one really big development is going to be they're going to be more. There's going to be significantly more diversity in terms of the number of parties who are involved in the creation and sustenance of the quote unquote games industry. Um, you know, there are over 30 different companies this year that are generating over a billion dollars in games uh, in revenue. You know, 10 years ago, that number was like five, 10, you know, it was, it was significantly smaller. So it's just the pie. It's not a question of like, there's a fixed pie and it's just how to like divvy up this gaming audience. It's that the pie is growing and that creates more seats at the table for a lot of different, a lot of different parties. Many of whom are, are not necessarily people you would traditionally assume associate as being a you know being a part of the the games the games universe. So that's one big thing that I see coming down the pike. I mean, I think the second big one is um I don't think we've fully baked in, I don't think we fully understand the impact that gaming as a place for social networking and presence, like where that happens, particularly for Gen Z. So we, when we talk about social networks, for example, we talk about TikTok, we talk about, you know, maybe Twitch, for example, um, you know, maybe we talk about, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter to a lesser extent, right? So um, these are all places that we sort of think of as being part of like that web too. Um, I think that, you know, gaming is one of these places where we sort of, I think when we talk about video games, we often think of them as just being video games. But for younger folks, like these are places where people are spending significant amounts of time connecting with their friends, making new friends. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the, um, the way in which early social networks were sold to the public as a place to stay in touch, a place to build relationships. Um, I think as that um, enthusiasm has maybe started to wane, there's a little bit of like reality kind of like setting in. Um, gaming has continued to be an excellent place for those things to happen. So I don't think we fully baked in like what that is for um, a generation that's growing up primarily using games as a social vehicle, what their expectations are going to be not just with games, but with other types of media as well. So those are the two, two big things that like I'm keeping in mind. It's like the impact of both those non-game publishers publishing games and then also games as basically forms of social networks. Um, those are two big things that I, I'm keeping an eye on. I think they're going to be really impactful and important for marketers to be keeping an eye on as well.
Absolutely. Great points. Great points. All right, Jamin, this has been a really interesting conversation and I appreciate you coming on the show today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Where can people find out more about your work? Yeah, absolutely. Two places, LinkedIn. It's just Jamin, J-A-M-I-N, Warren. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one on there. It shouldn't be hard to find. <laughs> um, uh, but then 256.co. So 256 spelled out.co. You can find us there. Um, we have a you know, we have a newsletter that we send out that looks at the intersection of brands and marketing. Um, you know, we have lots of content there. There's content upgrades. It, I just, you know, if there's anything that you're interested in, we definitely can be a place to be helpful there. So those are the two places that I would go. Mm-hmm.